on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. People are not getting the full story. Rather than becoming close to extinction, polar bear numbers worldwide are continuing to go up. I've seen so much footage of bears swimming or bears on fragmenting ice. Am I just seeing bears at a time when the ice is breaking up and this is just a normal phenomenon? Polar bears put on all of their weight in the spring when they're feeding on baby seals. Two thirds of their yearly calories. If I were to have an opportunity to go to Nunavut and hunt polar bear. Do you think that that is an ethical or unethical decision to make as a hunter? You need to stick to the science and I'm going to call you out on it if you're going off that track. I'd like the idea of biologists being able to make the decision about take and I get frustrated when it's like, no, we just can't do this anymore because of the charisma of the animal. I can no longer do any kind of research. I can't collaborate, but they haven't made me shut up. Episode number 71 of the Wild Fed Podcast, The Truth About Polar Bears with Susan Crockford, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. It's late winter and your body's need for vitamin D3 is greater than ever. That's because vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin you store in your liver, and it's like a bank account that you fill up during the sunny summer months and draw off of throughout the winter. Don't let your vitamin D3 levels fall dangerously low. Check out the Daylight Concentrate from Sir Thrival. It's a super concentrated bioavailable vitamin D3 sourced from sheep lanolin and a vitamin K2 sourced from Japanese natto. Remember, insufficient vitamin D3 levels have been implicated in negative flu and COVID outcomes, and keeping your levels up costs just a few cents a day. Find Sir Thrival's Daylight Concentrate Vitamin D3 K2 supplement at SirThrival.com. This episode's also brought to you by Wild Food Warehouse. I've been telling you about the incredible hand-foraged, wood-fire-parched wild rice at Wild Food Warehouse, but now they're carrying a line of beautiful hand-harvested berry and plant superfood powders from the northern latitudes of Finland. Their blueberry, lingonberry, and spruce tip powders are all sourced from pristine lands north of the Arctic Circle. They're loaded with flavor and rich in key nutrients like vitamin C. Wild Food Warehouse recently sent me a bottle of each, which I mostly use by mixing with a liter of water, a squeezed lemon, and a little stevia, which makes a super refreshing and really hydrating drink. The color and flavor of these powders is awesome, which speaks to how well they've been preserved. Head over to wildfoodwarehouse.com to check out their selection of Arctic-sourced fruit and superfood powders, and of course, for all your wild rice needs too. And as always, the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your order at wildfoodwarehouse.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. My guest today is Dr. Susan Crockford, zoologist, author, and the polar bear expert that's rocking the boat on the climate change narrative that these bears have become through very manipulated data and media talking points enmeshed in. To be clear, this podcast isn't countering the theory of climate change, but rather the way polar bears have been misused as the charismatic megafaunal poster children for climate change. We've all heard it by now because it's been repeated for more than a decade. Polar bears are imperiled because of rapidly melting ice in the Arctic. Well, the truth isn't that simple, nor does the actual science support it. In fact, as she points out in her book, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened, polar bear numbers have been on the rise, and these bears, which have survived many alterations to climate and habitat in the past 160,000 years they've been a species, are doing just fine. Yes, summer ice has been melting in the Arctic, but this has had little impact on polar bears, who rely on the spring ice, the remnant ice pack of the Arctic winter, to hunt and obtain their calories for the year, not on the summer ice, which has been receding in recent years. But rather than receiving praise for her work, straightening out the facts from fiction, she was instead maligned for not supporting a false narrative about polar bears, a narrative based on flawed modeling and a desire to use this species to achieve political and social ends. As someone who hunts, fishes, and forages, I care deeply about the future of the planet and the health of the ecosystems that provide me with wild food. But I don't like fake, faulty science being used to manipulate the way I see the world. That's not science at all. That's social engineering, and it's wrong. Even if the outcome being sought is right, 
Humans do need to reestablish a healthy relationship with our planet, but we don't need to lie to ourselves about polar bears to do it. So today, Susan is going to correct the record on polar bears, what's really going on with the Arctic ice, and what can happen when you step out of line in the scientific community. She also happens to have done her dissertation on the domestication of dogs, which is a recurring theme here on the show, so we talk a bit about it in the beginning too, but then transition pretty quickly to the largest terrestrial carnivore on Earth. That, of course, is the polar bear. Whatever your views on climate change and the politics surrounding it, I think after hearing this you'll agree polar bears have been used, misused is probably a better way to say it, to add an emotional charge to the climate change narrative. They were used to make it personal. The only problem is, they were wrong. Instead, they'll keep pushing the same story and they'll slander anyone who dares to speak out against it. Now, one last thing, since interviewing Susan, I read her children's book, Polar Bear Facts and Myths, as well as her first novel, Eaton, both of which she describes later in this interview. I read the children's book in just a few minutes, which was refreshing since I'm used to books like this always having a climate change agenda rather than being an honest look at polar bear biology. It's made a great addition to my wife's teaching library. And I couldn't put down Eaton either. I read it over the course of two days and was enthralled. Now, it's a self-published first novel, but I found it not only very readable, but really exciting and fun. It's a thriller imbued with a lot of polar bear ecological science and an underlying counter-narrative to the constant imperiled polar bear inculcation that we've been subjected to for far too long. In fact, I got her second novel, Upheaval, on the way, and I'm looking forward to reading that one next. Polar bears are one of the most incredible extant animals on the planet, and I want them to be here in perpetuity. We all should want that. But let's start having a more honest and objective conversation about them and how they're affected by climate. We owe it to ourselves to be faithful to the science. Susan Crockford, welcome to the show. Hello, Dan. Nice to be here. I am so excited to talk to you. I've uh, I've got your book here, uh, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened. Is that the title? Yes. And, uh, and I've been watching some videos of yours, and you just seem like such an interesting character, and um, your work is so fascinating to me. So I just wanted to share the floor with you today. Um, tell us a little bit about who you are, you know, what your background is in education, and, and all the many things that you, uh, you know, write and teach about. Okay, uh, I am a zoologist. I have a PhD um, that I did in the topic of uh, domestication and evolution. Um but to say that I'm a zoologist with an interest in evolution really is a bit confining. Um, what I actually do for a living is identify animal bones, um, mostly that come from archaeological sites, but uh, often things like stomach contents or fecal samples of animals. Just for example, um, doing um identifying the fish species that sea lions are eating. And that's something that, you know, fisheries management people want to know what the interaction is between seals and and human fishers. Um, And that just gives them an idea of what the uh, sea lions are actually eating. So that's what, you know, brings in the most of my income. Okay. And then, as someone who as someone who fishes, what I understand from the anglers out there, uh, particularly the commercial fishermen, is that they eat whatever those guys are out there trying to catch, don't they? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and you know, one of the interesting things is that that we really that aspect of our business really took off at the point where we talked to people who were studying. Um, the diet of the sea lions and what they were doing was identifying what's called the otolith, the little ear stone Mm -hmm. that fish have in them. And, you know, they're a magical um, little element. They, you know, you can tell the age and the size of the fish from it and the species, um, but they don't always survive in Mm. a fecal sample or in a stomach sample. And so what we were able to show these biologists was that their sample that they were taking was actually biased and that they weren't actually getting all the parts. And I, I recall one going into one guy's office and, you know, he said, well, you know, the, the fishermen keep telling us that the they're eating salmon. Well, they're not eating salmon. You know, we've got the data already here. And um, my colleague said, well, did you save the samples? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, can we see them? And so we just went through the, the you know, his little tray of vials. 
this is salmon and this is salmon and this is salmon because they were only using the otoliths. They weren't recognizing uh, the fact that they had the, the pieces of the backbone in there. And so you were that, able to identify vertebra. And, Exactly. And so our business in that aspect of it just took off. And now it's it's actually virtually all that I do is oh, um, wow. this dietary um, component. So, Okay, and, so that's, and your day, became, that's your day-to-day. <laughs> that's my day-to-day. That's my day-to-day. Okay. And, and so I can honestly say I do shit. You know, like <laughs> that, that is my work day. Right um, And... So, but, you know, because my, my basic interest in all of these things is evolution, you know, how these different species, you know, how they differ from each other and why, um, I, I got interested in dog domestication, oh, back in the early 1990s. And it eventually led to me doing um, a, my PhD dissertation on looking at the process of domestication as a speciation process. Mm. And as part of that, I was looking at the evolution of the polar bear because I've always been interested in the Arctic. And so what I did was look at wolf to dog compared to brown bear to polar bear. And so I used the brown bear to polar bear as kind of a, a wild example compared to the domestic. Um, can, I ju- can I ask example. about that? Sure. Do, yeah. Do, does the so so for the listener, uh, Ursus arctos, the brown bear, and Ursus maritimus, the polar bear, is yes. the polar bear directly descended out of the brown bear lineage? As far as we know, yes. Okay, and now they are starting to interbreed again. Well, no, there there has been some evidence of hybridization between the two, but it's it's okay. actually quite rare. And okay. the, the the examples that were all in the news. In the, in the last 10 years or so, turned out to be one polar bear female that had okay. made it to two brown bear males. And all of the hybrid offspring that she she had all came from that one female. And okay. there hasn't been any since. Okay, great. God, thank you for that. So you were comparing sort of the speciation uh, of bears and you and comparing that with with wolves to the domestic dog. Um, I'd love to hear anything you want to share about that because I'm fascinated by the topic. We have had some folks on here, and to me, I feel like in some ways that's the most monumentous moment in human history. Really, is it? Oh, the absolutely, absolutely, and that's and that's why you know it's like. Uh, it, it uh, it is like nothing makes sense ex- except in within this context of evolution. And what I did was just try to, after reading all of the literature, all the theories about how all this stuff goes on, I sat down and it was actually my 40th birthday present to myself, was to give myself the time and whatever money it took me to investigate this question. How is it? in strictly biological terms that you could turn a wolf into a dog. Mm -hmm. So just looking at the biology and what I found was that the common denominator of all of the biological systems that had to change was thyroid hormone. Oh, wow. And so that's where it led me. And it, it is kind of a long story, and we could spend the whole hour talking about that if you wanted, or I could come back again. But really what, what it led to was a concept of um, hormones being the sort of leader. Thyroid hormone is, is the um, system in the body that um, is responsible for immediate adaptation, if you will, for adaptation to heat or cold. It's what, you know, it's, it's what the body uses to adapt to changes in the environment. Okay. Now, now if I could, one question I have. So I always think of thyroid hormone as thermoregulation. Um, But are you saying that that's just one of the ways that we adapt to change the environment? One of many things that it does. And it's actually really, I, I think of it as, um, a, a conductor of it's it's in control of of regulating all of the other hormones and their responses. Mm. It also regulates um, fetal development, um, 
all of the things that go on in reproduction. It's, it's really, it's quite complicated. Um, but what it does is give us an, um, another way of thinking about adaptation as in an animal moves into a new environment. And one of the things that the thyroid hormone does is impacts um, like the flight or fight response. Mm-hmm. And that that um, that in it, that innate um, way that it inter- interacts in a new environment, and what we know is that there's individual variation in all of that. So some animals are brave, if you will, and some are really timid. And so that the proposal is that really only the most fearless individuals are going to be ones that colonize a new environment. Okay. And so that it, in the initial sort of generation or two, there's there's really something going on there that has to do with hormones interacting with behavior and reproduction. And that all of that is, you know, the the genetic mutations or what whatever are kind of hidden within that. So that eventually it does come come out. There is definitely um, genetic mutation involved in it, but at a level that um, is not immediately apparent. W- would you say that the domestication process? I, I've kind of I could make arguments for either side of what I'm about to ask you. So the question is: Is it? evolution or devolution and the reason is because i see it as primarily a, there's so much neoteny that would make me think this is sort of regressive to a species but then i can also argue like a pug is supremely adapted to a manhattan townhouse or you know an la condo uh so in that way i see it as an animal that's like very adapted but other ways it seems so maladapted to the planets that it's on do you think that domestication is an evolutionary thing or is it sort oh, of Oh absolutely I think it's I think it's really the one the prime example of evolution and it's something um that we should be we should be thinking about and understanding because it's so important and it's the animal I can talk ev- about evolution to people who know none of these animals. I can talk to city kids because they know what a dog is. They know the the individual yeah. variation within dogs and they know the different breeds. And, you know, it, it really is. Um, well, I, I made myself a little bumper sticker uh, with pictures of people hugging their, their dogs um, that says embrace evolution. <laughs> because okay. I, I really do think that this is one of the best examples we have. And the, in the neoteny, the, the neoteny that you talk about, um, we find it all over the place in, you know, in all animal kin- kingdoms. An octopus is a neotenous form of a squid. Mm, interesting. Right? Okay. So, so, I mean, you get these processes that are going on um, all, all through the animal and the plant kingdom. When you look at dog domestication, I guess one question I have, I really do want to talk to you about polar bears today, but I, I, I'm so into this topic that I, I got to ask some more questions. When you look at dog domestication, I have heard ranges of dates. They tend to be on the extreme end coming from the genetic work. And then from uh, on the more recent side, they tend to come from the archaeology. Where do you, you know, if you had to choose, where do you pin a sort of domestication date? And also, is the latest research telling us of multiple domestication events or of a single domestication events for the for the first dogs? Well, I think the more the more genetic data that we get, it seems almost the more complicated it gets. But I I think that what's happened recently is that the sort of number of events has maybe decreased from maybe three or four to maybe two or three. Wow. And that the dates, you know, the, the sort of firm archaeological dates are running around 12,000. And, but, and we really need to pay attention to that because, um, some of the genetic work, I mean, there's, there's issues with that, with the, with getting the timing right. I mean, the, the time frame is so short for some of these, um, 
methods that they use for trying to get um, dates out of the genetics. But uh, I think that really it's going to come out to be somewhere between 12,000 and 15,000. And where did um, these regardless. events happen? Because, you know, I mean, I, you, you see dogs living in villages with people everywhere in the world. And, um, you know, from the Arctic sled dogs to, you know, the villages in Africa, where, where did this happen? Um, and, you know, were these events separated by broad sweeps of time or did they happen in a fairly compressed period of time? Um, well, the... We know of one one location. It looks like um, is somewhere in Siberia, and there there may be another one in China and in the Middle East. Okay. Um, and it's you know really those still have not been sorted out yet, as far as I'm I'm aware. I haven't kept up totally on the. Um, right. on the literature. Yeah, changing signs. If you had warned me, I would mm-hmm. have gone and, and checked it out. But it, <laughs> has, uh, it um, yeah. but but what we're looking at, you know, so say between twelve and fifteen thousand years. But from what I have seen, what my research has has shown is that these these events, however many there were, um, would have happened within a very short period of time. And within, say, a human lifetime, within 60 years, you would have had an animal that going from a wild wolf to something that could live comfortably with people in a village. So that's a very wow. t- short okay. time first, frame. First, wow. <laughs> yeah. Do the, does the work, does the silver fox work out of Russia have hold any merit for you? Is there any value in the research you've done? Oh, absolutely. Or has, because I, absolutely. sometimes I hear... Okay. No, Can you well, explain I, I that a little bit to the listener? And well, really, all all they did was there. There was a lot of fox farming in the 1950s um, in Russia and and in North America as well. Um, but they were doing it on a big scale in Russia. And one of the things that they found was that um, the it was very unpleasant work. The animals were not happy being kept in cages. They didn't like to be handled. And it was is that made it unpleasant for the people. So um, this one zoologist thought, well, gee, you know, if we could make these animals um, more comfortable living in cages, it would be more pleasant for everyone. So he developed um, a selection experiment where he all he did was um, someone put a glove on their hand and stuck it in the fox's cage. And they judged the response. The animal either bit the hand or cowered in a corner, or came and sniffed at the hand. And what they did was chose only the animals that sniffed at the hand as being, you know, not an an extreme reaction either way, and then bred those animals together. And then every year, like they bred them every year, and then every year they selected puppies using the same method. And what they're saying is that they didn't use any other, you know, the animals weren't um, handled in any way. They weren't subjected to any special human treatment. Um, but that after only several generations, some of the animals got um, white markings um, like, a, like a border collie. Yeah. So piebalding, and, right? Uh, piebalding. And then they got a curl tail and um, flopped down ears, some of them. <laughs> and also the reproductive timing changed, which is something that is not always um, reported, that they went from, you know, a typical breeding period in um, March or April, I think it is, um, and moved and it moved back. And the more generations, the further back in time it went until some some of the animals at the end of 10 years were actually able to have two litters a year the way the dogs do. Wow. <laughs> so that was one of the keys you see about, so it's not, it's not just when a wolf changes into a dog that, you know, it has these physical or behavioral changes. It also has these reproductive changes. And so you have to look at all what's, what's causing the, the reproduction to change at the same time as all of right. the other ones. And the only, hormonal, thing, obviously. the only thing that links all of those things together is thyroid hormone. Ah, interesting. Okay. 
And then when you started to shift your focus over to bears, can you tell us a little bit about that and how and what you saw there? Well, in in that sense, then looking at bears, looking at, okay, when when would um, a polar bear naturally arise? What conditions would need to occur? And to me, that's obviously during an ice age, right? When when ice is coming down and covering an area, threatening to cover an area where brown bears already live. And if you go around the world and look at where there were bears, uh, brown bears, um, there's actually only a few locations where it could have happened. One is Southeast Alaska, um, Ireland, oddly enough, and maybe, maybe, maybe part of Kamchatka in the far east of Russia. Okay. So due to glaciation. uh, well, we, yeah, and so where you've got, and, and let's take the Irish example because it's maybe the easiest to understand, is that what you've got is sea ice developing, you know, in in the Arctic and then pushing down, you know, onto the British Isles, and it just overrides Ireland. And we know from remains in caves that there were brown bears living there. And wow. so what what would have happened what, what what are the choices for a brown bear it either you know it's it's area that it's living in is going to be um more and more constrained so if all of the animals stay there there's more and more competition for their resources and one option is to actually move out onto the ice okay where in fact we you know that's where the seals give birth in the spring And so if the animals go out there and then it's like, it's really just the same as a wolf moving into around a village, a human village. It's an, it's colonizing a new habitat that didn't exist before. And there are, you know, if, if the animals are successful catching seals, all it needs is the right individual to be going out there and interbreeding with an, another similar individual, and you get over a few generations um, an animal that is adapted to that new habitat. So do you think that this speciation can happen based on what you said about a 60 year event with dogs? I guess. Let me see. There's a couple of parts to this question. How much with that event with the dogs are human beings? you know, sort of unnatural selection by human beings, how much is influencing that? And how quickly do you think speciation can happen in the wild? Because I often wonder with the sort of classical Darwinian evolution, I wonder like, how is it possible that speciation, I know there's such long timelines, but I feel like I never feel, I never get like a really solid answer to how speciation works and how it can happen that there's so much diversity after such tremendous extinction events. Um, yes, so exactly. like how, how yeah. quickly can that happen? Well, very quickly. I mean, I think really within, within a few generations, Man, if you don't, cool. if you, if you don't have the changes that are necessary, it's not quick enough right. to allow the animals to survive. Right. Okay. I mean, that, if you think about it that way, it makes more sense. It has to happen quickly or they're right. not going to survive. Right. And so either it works or it doesn't. And it that has to happen yeah. quickly. Because there's such rapid as, periods of change on the earth that yes. that's what always makes me wonder, like, how can this be when when a comet strikes or something like that? And you have this immediate and rapid change. Things have to adjust very quickly. Yes. And when you think about, OK, so let's think about a brown bear that's out on the ice and it's and it, it's been living out there and it's been interbreeding with someone, uh, another another bear, and they're producing offspring. And this is like the second or third generation. And if there are individual bears in, in, in that litter that really, you know, can't handle it, they could perhaps, you know, go back to the land if there's still land to go back to, or they just don't survive. So there is a selection process still to right. select for the animals that are living there, the ones that are best adapted, and there will be selection every generation. 
But this hormonal change coming from the thyroid gland, you think kind of creates a little bit of plasticity in how the genome's expressed beyond yes. just I mean, pure selection from the environment? It does. And, and you know, it, it gets complicated. Um, but um, I think of it as like a bird song. So the thyroid hormone, all hormones are um, produced in, in a rhythmic fashion. Like it's not steady. It's a, a pulsatile release of hormone. Mm-hmm. And so I think of it as being like a species specific pattern, like you would have with a bird song, but okay. that within that species, you would have individual variation, you know, just slight, slight differences. And so that one of the, manifestations of the differences in that rhythm for the species is a difference in size, you know, how big the animals are, but also this response to stress, you know, whether, whether animals are fearful or um, brave in the face of something new. And that ends up being the selective pressure. Tell, tell me, say, I didn't quite understand that part. Explain that to me again about how the, the courage or the bravery or the timidness plays into it. Well, well, just that, um, say if you have a pack of wolves and that are living outside of the fir- one of the first human villages and okay. there's food there, you know, the people are hunting and they're taking back their catch. And so the, the wolves know there's food there. Mm-hmm. And they want to go in and get it. But some of the animals are going to be just too timid, afraid of the people. Right. They just have right. such a flight, uh, a, a really strong um, flight response that they they just can't tolerate being that close to people. And, but the animals who actually are, can, you know, manage to sneak around and, and not have their fear overwhelm their ability to figure things out. Those are the animals who will be able to successfully get in there and get to the food. <laughs> okay. There's a good uh, personal metaphor in there then. <laughs> I like, I like that. <laughs> um, tell me about how you became interested in polar bears, uh, you know, and the Arctic. I'm curious about that. And I want to talk more about what's happening up there because every time I bring up polar bears to people, it's like there's this propaganda that gets repeated back to me that it does not seem to align um, completely with the data. And uh, so I'm curious, like how you arrived at this interest in the Arctic and polar bears and then what's actually happening there and, and how is it that we've gotten, you know, sold a story about polar bears that may or may not be true? Well, like I said, I've, I've, I have been interested in the Arctic since I was a kid and also really interested in Arctic dogs, which was one of my sort of oh, okay. um, jumping off points. But um, polar bears really fascinated me even as a child. And so it, it just seemed natural to me um, when I was looking at this evolutionary question to include polar bears as well, because it just, you know, uh, allowed me the opportunity to dig into the literature um, on the bears, on their ecology, to looking at the um, the geological history of ice formation. I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to look at all of it to understand how these things would be going on. And so once, once I got that interest, um, it was really just before um, bears were proposed to be put on the U.S. endangered species list. And um, I belong to a listserv that was asking for um, an, for volunteer editors for a document that was going to U.S. Congress. So it was something that someone at the Library of Congress had put together um, to inform Congress in order for them to make a decision. So he'd sent this, at this document. Point- at this point, they already had protection under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, I would assume. Oh, this absolutely. Was going, yeah, that, this that was came going in further. in 72. Yeah, going back, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, I think, came in in 1972. And then in 1973, there was an international treaty protecting bears all around the world. So all Arctic nations signed this treaty in 1973. So they had been protected since then. Um uh, so going forward, this 
this was something this was something else so i was i was asked to review this document and i did and made some um i got even more into the literature at that point getting myself right up to date and made some recommendations. And that was really the point at which I thought, you know, something else is going on here that um, is, you know, how, that people are not getting the full story of. And so that was about, you know, 2007. And in 2012, um, I started writing a blog uh, called Polar Bear Science. And I, I just felt it was, Um, would be really useful for people to have some place to go where if a new paper came out, for for example, and it's all over the newspapers, that they could get um, something, uh, an an interpretation of it that gave them the background. uh, That was what I often felt was that, you know, a lot of it was sensationalized and, you know, it's got the message of the day, but it doesn't really put it always in context of what's important. And can you, can you, can you give us an example there so that we bring that down to the ground level? Cause I want to make sure I understand it. Um, You're at this time, what year are we talking about? Uh, What, when I started my blog? Uh, Yeah. When is that? 2012. Okay, so at that time, what kind of sensationalism is happening and what's the public perception versus the reality of the science as you saw it at the time? Well, I think that really the, that it, it was almost at the height of um, what I would call the hype of, of mm-hmm. just every time something came up, it was, you know, uh, the, the bears are going to die, the bears are going to die. Um, and 2012 was also the year that... Arctic sea ice in September hit its lowest level that it's been since 1979. Okay. So that, you know, that was one of the, one of the um, reasons for, for all the hype that particular year. Can you explain Uh, to listeners who wouldn't, who maybe don't understand why the, the perception of and why the reality of the ice is important for these animals and then sort of at what time of year too? I just want to make sure everyone understands why, this um, story is of the sea ice is relevant exactly. So um, what we have to do is go back to just some basic polar bear biology, really. And that is that bears, um, most of them are out on the sea ice in the winter, which is sort of um, January to March. Because they and do not hibernate the way that a brown bear or a no only or a black only bear. females go off into a den and hibernate when when they're going to have cubs. So okay. only the females um, go and hibernate in a den in the winter, and the rest of them are out in the ice. And you know the the implication is that they are hunting at that time. But in actual fact, what we do know is that um, they don't eat very much over the winter because the bears are almost all at their lowest weight at the end of March, Mm -hmm. which is telling you that they're living off their fat for most of the winter. They might catch a seal or two, but it's, it's not going to be very much. They're basically living off their fat. So what they really need is newborn seal pups that are born in April. Are they obligate carnivores? Like, because when I look at a black bear or a brown bear, I think what supreme foragers they are. The idea, I know that they, you know, are considered carnivores and I I know that they have the appearance of an animal that's going to eat a lot of meat, but in actual fact, they they eat so much plant food um, that I always think of them as foragers. Now, how does the diet of a, because I have seen imagery of polar bears diving for algae, which has just blown my mind seeing them swim and everything. But, you know, they eat considerably more meat than any of the other bear species in North America, right? Oh, so absolutely. What, yeah. So no. to what degree are they obligate carnivores at yeah. any level? Well, I, it- yes, I would say so, because they're, they're not going to be able to survive um, on anything. But- and it's not only just that they're eating other animals. What they absolutely require is fat. Fat. Yeah, and in fact, I've I've seen what was reading one paper where they had proposed that um, they thought the bears could actually eat on nothing but fat, like wow. not not protein at all, which is kind okay. of interesting. But I don't and, know if that's true. 
But if you gave the diet, I guess what I'm getting at is if I gave the diet of a grizzly bear or a, a brown bear to a polar bear, would they not be able to thrive on that? Or is it just that they're in an environment where there's such a dearth of plant food? Or is it that they have changed to a degree and this is now the diet they require? I, I don't know that anyone has ever tried to do that. Uh, my guess would be that they might <laughs> not like have would try the to do that. <laughs> well, exactly. But they might not have the ability right. to um, metabolize mm -hmm. carbohydrates into fat right. and at, and fat at the right time mm -hmm. of year. So if you think of, you know, you think of brown bears and black bears, that they are putting on all their weight during the summer and early fall, right? Getting ready for hibernation. Mm -hmm. Whereas ba polar bears put on all of their weight in the spring. They put yeah. on hundreds and hundreds of pounds. In the when spring, all the steels are on the ice. Two thirds, they eat two thirds of their yearly calories. Wow! In the spring, when they're feeding on Whoa. baby seals. Yeah. All right. So that's when you know it's it's really at total opposite seasonal ends uh, yep. of when they really need the most of their calories because they have um, a period in summer when seals are hard to catch, and then period in winter when they're also hard to catch. So the most important time for them is early spring, um, spring to early summer, when there's lots of baby seals. And then again, a secondary important period in the fall, where they have a chance to catch a few more seals to fatten up a bit, you know, to um, put on some of the weight they've lost over the summer. Mm -hmm. And so I'll back up now and we'll go back. So there's the bears feeding on the ice in the spring, eating the baby seals. And then in March is about the time when the sea ice, sea ice in the Arctic reaches its, its maximum extent. And from that time forward, it starts to retreat. So as it retreats, the bears are moving with it. Basically, they stay on the ice. But then as it gets into the summer, the ice starts to, to break up to, you know, get melt ponds on it and to, to break up a bit. And that's what one of the reasons why the seals are hard to catch in that summer ice, because it's easy for the seals to escape. You know, if they're sitting on the ice, there's lots of holes around for, you know, mm -hmm. if the bears stalking them. So in some areas of the Arctic, the, the bears stay with the ice, just completely with it. And as it retreats up into the Arctic basin, they stay with it and stay on the ice the whole time. In other parts, such as Hudson Bay and for some of the bears on the coast of Alaska, what they do is go on to land when the ice retreats. So they spend the summer on land. So when they're, when they're on land unless they can find something to scavenge, like a carcass of something that washes up dead on the beach, um, they basically fast. They don't eat anything for, for the summer. So they can't actively hunt caribou or something like that. They're not. No, that, they they're really not fast. They might catch, they might catch a calf if they were really lucky, but you know, okay. I've seen pictures. There's a, there's a, one of those live cat cat cams that set up on the shore of Hudson Bay and you can watch them and there there will be bears all all over the place and a herd of caribou will just walk right past them and they like ignore each other okay and i have seen them trying to you know but but seems very difficult with walruses and things like that where they seem to risk so much injury in the process of trying to take some an animal like that yeah yeah absolutely and i don't know you you may have heard of some the um walruses falling off the cliffs to their death. Yeah, um, well, which is a big part of what I want to ask you about because yeah. that event, if I understand now, correct me if I'm wrong, but that kind of came around, that looked like, that was sold as a climate change thing and then kind of came around that it looked like the people filming it kind of caused that event. Is that? Is well, that no, no. In fact, what it, it was the polar bears. There were polar bears up on top of the cliffs oh, okay. that were hurting the walruses and driving them off the <laughs> off the top of the cliff okay. and apparently they'd been doing it for years okay and and the thing about it about the filmmakers was that they knew that that's what they were was happening but oh but they sold they, it as climate they change. sold it as climate change and that, okay. that was why it was so outrageous was okay. that um you know 
I mean, and, and then I saw the, the video that they made, and, and I mean, they do a tear jerking, compelling, oh my God, the sky's falling kind of yes, story. No, absolutely. It, and, but in fact, you know, it's really just a very, very clever hunting strategy by the bears because once the walrus are down uh, at the bottom of the cliff, then in fact, they can feed on, on those carcasses for months. Wow. And that's what exactly yeah. what they do. Wow. So, okay. Strategy humans have employed for a very long time over the course of history, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better than okay. facing an, a 2,000-pound animal with enormous tusks. Um, on, on this topic, when I see, because again, I've seen so much footage of bears swimming or bears on fragmenting ice, and it's always with this climate change story. And I often wonder, am I just seeing bears at a time when the ice is breaking up and this is just a normal phenomenon, but with the right music and the right voiceover, it can be sold as the ice is disappearing in these animals? Because I think sometimes people forget, how do I say this? In the same way that when you talk about hunting, a lot of times people forget that animals that aren't killed by hunters won't just live forever <laughs> and that yeah. there's recruitment every year. So they, I think a lot of people hear, well, there's, there's X amount of animals and you're taking some of them. It's like, yes, but this many more are produced every year. There's new recruitment every year. So it's not just like we're drawing off a bank account <laughs> that's not replenished. And so yeah. similarly with the ice, I think it's like a lot of the lay people who've never studied anything about the Arctic assume that the ice is just steady melting and not realizing that it builds and melts and builds and melts. And so, yeah. So anyway, I wonder sometimes when I'm seeing that, because I know um, I spent some time up in uh, Newfoundland last year and they were telling me about the issues around the seal hunt and, uh, and how sustainable the seal hunt is for them, but how now they can't export any of the seal parts due to the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And that because baby seals have tears in their eyes, they've become this great candidate for selling a certain story that isn't necessarily accurate to what's happening. So when I'm seeing David Attenborough describe, you know, our impending doom and polar bears having to swim and, and jump from ice to ice, is that not a normal phenomenon? We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. Are you looking for some wild-caught fish for the table or to top up your freezer this year? Salmon Sisters ships frozen and smoked wild salmon direct to your door, as well as some other wild Alaskan species like cod and halibut. The Salmon Sisters, Emma and Claire, and their all-women team are headquartered in Homer, Alaska, where they make their living harvesting wild seafood from Alaska's pristine waters. Check out their Wild Alaskan Coho Salmon Box for vacuum-sealed serving size portions or their Wild Alaskan Sockeye Salmon Box for full fillets that'll feed your whole family or fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready-to-eat smoked salmon in pouches and their smoked salmon tins, which are also ready to eat. They've also got a beautiful cookbook, a super cool women's clothing line, and their own custom line of printed Extra Tough brand boots. Go over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your first order of wild fish. And you can always go back to episode number 51 of this podcast. It's called Made of Salmon, the Salmon Sisters of Alaska, to get to know Emma and Claire a bit better too, and to find out just where your salmon is coming from. Again, head over to aksalmonsisters.com and use the coupon code WILDFED. Now, back to the show. It's absolutely normal for the, for the bears. I mean, they're encountering, they encounter... Um, ice that's breaking up and that has melt ponds in it um, in the summer and then thin ice when it starts to form again in the fall. And so they, they learn strategies of how to maneuver on thin ice. And it's something they learn. Actually, uh, one of the things I posted on my uh, blog was something that I found was a clip. I think somebody used um, a drone to capture this footage was a mother with a couple of cubs was playing on the, they were out on the ice and it was just freezing. So it was thin ice. These little cubs were just a year old, but they were deliberately going out on this thin ice until they broke through it. And then okay. they crawled out and then they went back and did it again. Training. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But, okay. you know, they, so they learn, they learn how to do that. And one of the reasons why the polar bears are so powerful in their front end is because they have to 
you know, grab onto the ice and haul themselves uh, up, out of the water. Yeah. Right? You know how hard that is to get yourself out of a pool. But it's also one of the reasons why they're very good climbers. Like okay. they can they can climb over ice and they can actually they're really almost as good as mountain goats from what I've seen of like climbing wow. up cliffs and stuff because they're really, really powerful in their front end. OK, but they but they have to learn that and they start learning it, obviously, when they're cubs. OK, now I've gotten you pretty diverted. I apologize because you were I, I, I asked you to explain a little bit about how they hunt uh, on the ice, but I've gotten you off track a bit. So I want to give it back. To well, we too. were just talking about the seasonal you know, um, the seasonal biology of what right. happens. And, and one of, one of the points really was that, um, bears fasting or not eating during the summer is actually entirely normal. Okay. And even bears that are out on the ice in the middle of the summer don't have many opportunities to catch seals just because of the nature of the seals. The seals actually are out in open water most of them feeding at that time. So they don't have many op- very many opportunities to hunt in the summer. And one of the things that happened um, when the bears were proposed as being threatened with extinction in the U.S. was that they wanted to use this, these climate models and the models were proposing that sea ice was going to disappear. But it was only the summer ice not the winter ice and not the spring ice. Right. So the biologists, I can't fathom really for the life of me, but they chose to focus on the summer ice when actually they knew. I mean, they, I know they know because I got this information from their papers. It's what they have written. So, so they're they saying that, this, that the, the, the loss of summer ice was going to create impending doom for polar bears when in fact they wouldn't polar bears be able to hunt. Be, but they don't anyway. And but they don't anyway. And no one's saying that we're going to lose the winter slash spring ice, of course, because no. it gets so cold there. No, exactly. Uh, okay, so this is so polar bears were sort of being used to push a narrative. Do you think is that fair to say, or am I going too yeah, far? Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you also have to keep in mind that. <clears throat> At that point in time, the bears had been, so they'd never been on the U.S. endangered species list, but there's an international uh, conservation body called the IUCN. Okay. And they do the red ha- list and all that. That's the red list. And yeah. they had been listed as vulnerable on that list and then were taken off. They were downlisted to least concern. In 1996, because the, their populations had rebounded once they wow, were protected. Le- least in, concern. Least concern. In, okay. Because when, once they were protected in 73 from overhunting, their numbers went up. Okay. So in 1996, they were downlisted to least concern. And that's where they were until 2006, when the polar bear biologists got together at one of their meetings and I'm getting this information from reading the minutes of their meeting that is published. You know, it's publicly available that they discussed the fact that they could get the bear bumped back up to vulnerable if they use these climate models, because we could propose that the bear is going to be vulnerable 30 years from now. And there should, or it should, it, so it, it's totally based on, and it's totally based on predictions for the future, but that particular one, it, they didn't even make a model. They just said, this yeah. is what we think is going to happen. And that was accepted. And that was, then they turned to, that was 2006. Then in 2007, they turned to the U S one and got it um, listed as threatened. It's basically the same thing. It's just different terminology. Um, but in that case for the, um, ESA, they they actually put together a, a, a sciencey looking model, um, but in fact, it's all. This was the first time in for both of those organizations that a prediction for what might happen in the future was used to determine one of these classifications, rather than the current situation and what was happening on the ground at that point. What what is the m- who wins? Who benefits? What's the motivation? Because 
Um, I understand, let, let, for instance, I, I'm interested in the American eel, and there's been a lot of talk about their numbers and the potential of listing them. However, because their distribution is just so, their range is so broad, if they were to become listed, the number of industries impacted would be so severe um, that it's unrealistic that anybody will actually get them, you know, list it because it's just like, but it would, it would affect too many things. Yeah. So there's politics there, right? So similarly, but you know, in the Arctic where there isn't much industry, I know there's mining, but not significant. What, what would be the benefit of the listing? Um, or was it to push the climate narrative or was it to, to interfere with some industry? Like why would they want that so bad? Is it just the care people who care about bears and don't want to see them killed or, or why? Well, why I think it's, it's, there's a number of things. And one of them is, I think first and foremost is that if the bear is considered um, any animal is considered threatened or um, vulnerable, it automatically increases government grants for research. Okay. So that's one consideration. Um, another one at, at the time, I don't even think at that time they were really worried about oil exploration. That was an earlier concern, but by the late nineties, that was no longer really an issue. Um, it, and, but mostly I think it was to push this narrative of the bear, the polar bear being an icon for climate change. Okay. And that it, if it was on the endangered species list, that that would help, um, promote Validate. the narrative. What, 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 how did you, man, I had so many questions. How did you end up in opposition to this idea and what underlies that for you? Is it, is it like, hey, this just isn't true, and as a scientist, I can't stand that you're lying? Is it that the narrative around climate change you don't think is accurate? Is it some combination, or is it something else? Where, where when did you decide to start to be a voice of opposition here? And because I imagine you have dealt with tremendous pushback on this. Oh, absolutely. I I think one of the issues that really. Um, pushed me forward on this was events that went on in Alaska. So the coast of Alaska has a very particular kind of sea ice dynamic. And what I knew from the literature, and this is from what the polar bear researchers had been writing for decades about the fact that this is what they'd learned, that about every 10 years, the ice in the spring along the coast of Alaska gets so thick that the seals can't have their pups there. They can't get because up they the can't Because they can't get through the ice and they can't feed. So they okay. go somewhere else. As a consequence, when the bears that have either made their dens on the land or, you know, just a little bit offshore, when the mothers come out with their new cubs and they really need to eat right away at that point, there was no seals. And the worst aspect or the worst incident of this happened between 1974 and 1976. Extremely well documented in the literature of exactly what happened. There was widespread starvation. The, the biologists were writing about, you know, bears that were looking like skeletons walking mm -hmm. around. Bears dying. They figured that the population dropped by at least 50%. Wow. And then along comes a similar event in 2004 to 2006 that now they're saying this is that the there's another population decline. There's in fact another one of these thick ice events, but now they're saying it's climate change. <laughs> they're saying it's warming, but and I, I'm sorry. That was the one that that was really what set yeah. me off. Is okay. that you know like you've you've documented this, and you've said you don't really understand it that you thought that ice ice should be a stable platform and that this is working entirely against what you had believed in, and now you're going to turn around and say that this is because of less sea ice in summer. 
<laughs> and, what, ha- what happened when you started to say that? Well, I mean, that it... Because it there's a scientific up. consensus. <laughs> oh, 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 absolutely, absolutely. But, you know, what, what really was happening was that, you know, I, I started to get attention and I started to be um, contacted by journalists and people were interviewing me. And then what would happen is like, you know, like CBC would interview me and one of the biologists would go to CBC. You can't, you can't trust her. You can't talk to her. She's not a polar bear biologist. You can't you know, that, that's not a reputable, um, thing. So you, you, you can't believe anything she says. And so that's how they were dealing with it at that point. And, but it really wasn't all that effective because people were seeing once you point out, and I was making the literature available to people and, you know, where I could, where, you know, the, the copyright laws would allow, I've made plain to my readers, if there's something that I can't, you know, actually post the PDF online, if you write to me and ask for it, I can send it to you. And so the information was starting to get out. And the only thing that had protected them up to that point was that nobody in their right mind would have, you know, dove into the literature the way that I did. (laughs) <laughs> right. So that, you know, that these kinds of changes in position would come out. And that's why they were so outraged is there's so much literature. I, I mean, it was a lot to read, but I just made it. That's my um, hobby. Now yeah, it's what I do right. in my spare time. And okay. um, it's, it's trying to put the pieces together um, and when it really hit the fan was in um, late 2017, where two of the leading biologists, so the leading one, Stephen Amstrup in the U.S. and Ian Sterling in Canada, got together with um, climate change um, scientist Michael Mann and with a bunch of other people, 14 oh, of he, them. He loves 14 you. 14 of huh? them it took. <laughs> And put together a, a paper for this uh, journal that's called Bioscience. That's really just for, essentially, it's for um, high school biology teachers. It's not really um, an academic journal, really. Um, but what they, they called their, the title of their paper was Internet Blogs, Polar Bears, and Climate Change Denial by Proxy. Mm. And they tried to, you know, print, present evidence that, in fact, you know, I was by challenging what they were saying about polar bears, it, it proved I was a climate change denier, that I was trying to destroy their climate change narrative by questioning what they were saying about polar bears. And really, but what they tried to do was to destroy my um, reputation and um, impinge my integrity. And it was really a slimy, nasty thing to do. And most of my, the col- my colleagues that have seen it have just said, well, I wouldn't read anything like that. I mean, it, it just sounded stupid. I mean, I think they used right. the word denier 37 times in the whole paper. It, it drives it, me it, crazy because that term it seems obviously drawn from the Holocaust denier. Absolutely. Title. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're implying something so wretched about a person when all you're doing is questioning this narrative. And for me, uh, I think, and I, I'd like to get your you know opinions on climate change as it's presented and as it's happening. Um, because I would say for me, I look at the world and I can't imagine how this much alteration to landscape and this much loss of biodiversity and in this much harvest that we wouldn't be you know i i feel we're playing with the cogs and gears of the whole machine of course things are changing um but i also i also worry that so much of this climate change narrative is about uh sort of social engineering a new world and uh, a without necessarily the consent of everybody who's going to be affected by it so it seems like to me, if you were like, hey, is climate change happening? I'd be like, yeah. And they'd be like, do you agree with the narrative? I'd be like, not really that much. Um, not the way the narrative is being pushed. So anyway, that's just me. Uh, I'm definitely not a denier. I don't even know enough about it. But 
I, I have seen things in the narrative that feel dishonest and have for a long time to me. So anyway, that's kind of where I'm at with it. I'd be curious though, like how, wh- what's your position on climate change and, and the actual climate as it exists and then also the narrative separately from the climate? Well, really, because I've um, studied climate in the past, and especially even the recent past, say the last 40,000 years. Yeah, <laughs> where you it's know, changed like, dramatically. You don't, have to go, you don't have to go back that <laughs> right. far to right. know that the climate can change spectacularly. And... I have just not been convinced by the arguments right. that they've presented that this is outside the bounds of natural variation. Right, right. In the right. what way, uh, you know, the sea ice has declined. No argument there. You know, it, it, it obviously has. But there are systems, cycles that are going on that when you start looking back in time, you see them showing up time and again. It's like this cycle... In, on the shore of Alaska every 10 years. No one knows why that happens. And you said that the, the, the minimum sea ice was in, did you say 1997? No, it was 2012. Oh, okay, 2012 sorry. was the lowest it had been. And then last year, two, two, 2020 was the second lowest. Oh, okay. So we've, yeah, so we've had, we've had quite low sea ice starting by about 2007. Um, it's been up and down a bit, but it hasn't, it's basically flatlined since 2007. It's been up a bit and down a bit, um, but it really hasn't um, gone down a continuous trend. And what, why that's important for polar bears is that the polar bear specialists thought they knew how the bears would respond to low ice in summer. They thought that they had studied them for long enough that they could predict what would happen when the ice got that low. And it turned out they were wrong Hmm. because there had never been sea ice in summer that was that low before. So they had, you know, there, there was no data for them to look at. They had, they were just going on other things that they had learned about the bears, that they thought, oh, well, from that we can say that this is going to happen, such and so. But it turned out that that wasn't the case. And instead of, you know, in fact, in 2007, what they predicted was that when the ice got as low as it has been since 2007 and stayed that low for 10 years, which it has done, that two-thirds of the bears in the world would be gone. That was their prediction. They thought it wouldn't happen in two, two, until 2050. Okay. But it happened, in fact, right after they made their prediction. And that really upset them when I came along and pointed out that their prediction had, in fact, failed. And that rather than becoming close to extinction with that level of sea ice, in fact, the bears, bear numbers worldwide are continuing to go up. They're not going up really fast, but they're definitely going up. But they're not declining. They're not declining. Wow. Yeah, you know, I think that there's, I, I, I wish sometimes we would be separating because I feel like the term climate change has become this catch-all for all human impact. And sometimes I want to separate out habitat loss from climate stuff because it, we act like it's all the same thing for some reason. And to me, the bigger issue is habitat for places for animals to live, not the climate. Cause I would imagine uh, how long have polar bears been an extant species? Well, that's another big question. It's like <laughs> even more complicated than, than the dog but, thing. Right. Okay. So um, my best guess is um, around 160,000 years. Okay, so if we, if we looked been- at a hundred Go ahead. No, um, th- there's been um, some estimates that are much older than that. But uh, okay. if you look at it rationally about when it could realistically have happened, um, then about 160,000 years, there was a, a very strong glacial period then. And, and that's, that seems about the right time. 
So just looking at climate over 160,000 years, especially given the Pleistocene extinction and the tremendous loss of megafauna that took place in North America and the the radical changes that have happened in that time frame. I mean, and that's so recent. I just can't imagine that the polar bear has not experienced times of great warmth and great cold and the oh, idea well, that we they know would just they disappear. Have. Well, yeah, we right? know they have. Well, like even within since the last ice age, in the last um, 10,000 years, there's been... Uh, um, periods when the Arctic was essentially ice free, which is what they keep, you know, telling us is the big doomsday event. But that's already happened before. The problem is we don't have any data on what the polar bears were actually doing at the time. Like it is possible that numbers went down when that happened and then went back up again. Right. But, w- but not enough but to ha- leave a huge genetic did- bottleneck marker. No, but they obviously survived because right. otherwise they wouldn't be here. Right. So how many pol- how many are there now? The official um, estimate from the IUCN, which was done in 2015, was between 22,000 and 31,000, with a midpoint of about 26. So their tw- 26,000 is sort of what they're using as a, a midpoint. Okay, I'd be curious. And, what- but there has been surveys, you know, counts of bears since then that are, weren't available for that assessment that would put that total to almost 30,000. I was just talking to uh, the state of Maine's um, head bear biologist, and she was telling me that they've just hired somebody who's using new models. He'd just done something, I guess. I believe they said he was out of Cornell, but he'd just done something, you know, new new model, population model on polar bears, and that they'd hired him to come to the state of Maine, where we're always trying to figure out how many we have here. Uh, so I'd be curious yeah. when, when his data set emerges. But um, yeah, I just find this whole thing really fascinating because it seems like these animals sometimes get caught up in these political stories and get used in this way. So it's just really strange. Well, We're- and I think that's, it's really why I w- kind of wanted to poke my stick into it is, is because it's like to really just try and stick to the science of it and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and present it honestly. I mean, I can say honestly that if in fact the ice disappeared in the spring, the polar bears would be in trouble. Yeah. Clearly, that would be the case, but it's clearly now from the data not the case that when if the ice disappears in the summer, that that's really going to be an issue. If I had, this is a personal question that I have for you. Um, No, you know, of course, you don't have to answer it. But if I were to have an opportunity to go to Nunavut and hunt polar bear with, you know, the Inuit there. Do you think that that's an they where they subsistence hunt? And of course, there it's a very expensive hunt, very limited tags, um, hyper regulated, obviously. But if I were to be able to participate in that, do you think that that is an ethical or unethical decision to make as a hunter? No, I think that's an ethical um, decision to make. For for one thing, that um, the way that the that hunt is regulated, the way that I understand it is that what ha- what happens when um, a community gets a certain number of tags? Say they get five tags for their whole community. So they could say, well, we'll, we'll sell two of these tags to someone from down south. You know, they'll pay $50,000. They'll come up, but they all, those people, not only does that money go to the community, also the person hunting has to hire a local guide Right. And it's also bringing money to whatever else that they they need while they're there. So they're inserting money into that community. Um, And. Then they they sell those tags, but one once those tags are sold to the hunter who's coming from down south, it can't be transferred back. So if if that tag goes to you and you go out in your hunt and you don't get a bear, that tag's gone. Right. Okay. Whereas a tag that's issued for the community, they have a whole year 
to use that tag. As a community. So any as hunter, a community. Any community. And right. so, in fact, th- there is more likely to be more bears survive because right. there's going to be some hunters who crap out. Where that hunt exists is 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 that hunt allowed because the population is sufficient or is it allowed because there's a subsistence tradition amongst the indigenous there and that those rights have to be honored? It's both. It's both. And and certainly, you know, it, in there were areas where there was a concern about the hunting level being too high and it was curtailed even in the face of, you know, the um, subsistence hunt. It, it was curtailed for, for a while to let the numbers go back up. And so it's managed with the, all of those things in mind and keeping in mind as well that, you know, mostly what people take back from those hunts uh, is maybe a skull and, and the skin, but all of the rest of the meat and everything else goes to the community. So it's used. Right. There isn't anything wasted. Yeah. I'm uh, just, I bear oil is so such an incredible substance to me. You know, I cook with it, you know, we put it on our skin. I treat wood with it. I treat leather with it. It's just such an incredible oil. The meat to me is amongst the best meats in the world. I just, you know, as much as I love venison, I absolutely love bear meat. And of course I love the hides and the skulls. I just think the animal is so fascinating. Um, but underappreciated from a game perspective, but, um, in a food perspective, but it's just, I feel like you were saying earlier, I feel this call and this draw to the Arctic. I certainly don't want to go there and exploit, and I'm not looking to go there to have a trophy. I, that's not what it's about for me. Um, and I don't want to participate in something that will, you know, I don't care if people look at me and think it's unethical, but I don't want to feel it's unethical, you know? So I'm not one of these people who like wants to, you know, go to the big five in Africa or something like that. I I don't care about that. I'm, I'm very interested in where that there, there was a subsistence culture that relied on that animal and the other animals of the Arctic. And I would love to meet those people and interact but to me, I'm not a tourist. I like to be part of it and I like to interact in ecosystems. And so this, it's good to talk to you about this and get a, another perspective because I have bear biologist friends here in the state of Maine who think the idea of hunting a polar bear is just abhorrent and they can't get their heads around it. And I've been like, mm. man, if can- Canada is allowing this, Canada is such a progressive nation, you know, it'd be one thing if it was, a you know, a so-called third world nation that was issuing tags or something like that. But where it's Canada, I just feel like uh, there's something a little bit, you know, there's got to be something more going on there. So it's good to get your perspective. Well, yeah. And I, I know several um, hunters who like are like you, that it's, it's for them, it's the experience is why they go out. Um, and it's, it's not about a trophy. And um, a lot of th- those those kinds of inputs from conversations with those people ha- has been very important to me. Um, but I'll get back, if you don't mind, with your comment that you went to Newfoundland and you said that you had written read my recent science book, but did you n- realize that I have written two novels? You know, I just I was looking at them on Amazon today, but I haven't read them, so I'd love for yeah, you to talk about so it. Yeah, and so the one, the first one was my first novel. It's actually set in Newfoundland, and I, t- I call it my polar bear attack thriller. Eaten so is the So it's title, kind right? of like, it's it's called Eaten. Yeah, okay. And, and uh, it, it was just, uh, the, the, the question popped into my mind. You know, people keep talking about, well... Um, if, if the ice disappears, the bear's going to be so hungry and then we're really going to be in trouble because they're going to come <laughs> looking yeah. for food. And I thought, well, okay, what really, what really are the circumstances where bears would be in trouble, um, if they didn't have food? And I thought if they're, um, if the seal pupping season fails for some reason in the spring, they're going to really be in trouble. And where would be the most likely place where that could cause havoc if they came to shore? And I thought uh, immediately of Newfoundland. And so my story is set in the spring, off Newfoundland, ice off Newfoundland, when the 
um, harp seals there give birth to have all their pups are stillborn. That there's something happened, the pups are stillborn, the bears have nothing to eat, and they come on shore. And, you know, and it's just an interesting concept because when you think about it, the ice is there, the land is there, the bears just walk on shore. Right. Can I, I, I want to ask you a question about this because okay. I assume you did some research on, you know, polar bear attacks in order to write the book. And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay, so I have um, recently interviewed a, a, a guy called Carl Semensik, and he wrote a book about black bear attacks, yeah. which I assumed didn't happen much based on the fact that whenever they happen, they say, oh, this never really happens. So he points out that they happen at a rate of about 50% of brown bear attacks. So, I mean, for, yeah, that's yeah. For fairly high, actually. Now, what I learned that was really fascinating was that when a brown bear attacks, you know, the strategy is because it's generally territorial. The strategy is to play dead and let the bear win territory and you may survive that. Yeah. But a black bear attack is almost always exclusively predatory. And so the strategy is to fight with everything you have because the bear is going to eat you. And that's typically what yeah. happens in a black bear attack. Yeah. What are the what what is the what characterizes a, a polar bear attack? And uh, I'm assuming they're always predatory. I would guess. Yeah. yeah. But um. But what what circumstances uh, you know are usually present when this happens, and and how often does it happen? Well, I mean, in modern times, it doesn't happen that as often as you might think. How how because often of so it few ha people happened being in there? The, well, yeah, is part of it, but. The thing that you have to remember is that polar bears are stealth hunters. They, you know, they sit and wait, ambush and ambush oh, okay. seals, right? And so they are adept at hiding behind a rock mm. and just pouncing. But they also are very fast runners. And if they have, you know, uh, an opportunity, they will chase um, people in dog sleds, for example, there was a recent, oh, a recent okay. incident. It was last, last winter, I think, um, in North of Norway on, uh, Svalbard and a guy had a tour, you know, a t guiding, um, thing. And, and so he had a couple of people out and, uh, they were just about home and he realized this bear was chasing them and he stopped the sled but he said he didn't even have time to get his rifle. You know, it was there, but he couldn't get to it. And so he just reached for the, there's a rope that he used for a, for a break. And he just smacked the bear across the nose a couple of times with this rope. Oh. And that made, it, that made it back off. But, you know, it, it, it um, what they do is go for the head, which I think um, other bears do as well. Um, but that's the way they catch seals is they grab them by the head. And so okay. with polar bears, they almost always go for the head first. And then they obviously are going to eat. It's not a territorial thing. Exactly. You know, so exactly. You know, and, and one, yeah. And one of the things that I, 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 I actually, even before I did the novel, I was looking at this issue of, of bear attacks in general. And, you know, I just found it fascinating and, but I thought, you know, if you look at the evolutionary sequence, the oldest bears are black bears have been, out, been around for millions of years. Brown bears, not so much, like 600,000 is only as long as brown uh -oh. bears have been a lot around. Okay. And, then, and then polar bears are the most recent. So it goes black bears, brown bears, polar bears. But in descending, terms- Descending from who's their common ancestor? Because I know there were short-faced bears here. Um, yeah, no, the well, it, the, it's the black, the, so the black bear came out of a uh, brown bear at some point. The brown bear came out of the black bear, sorry. Okay, got you. Point. All yeah. right. Okay. So, but when you look at this aspect of predatory attack, when you're, when you're dealing with humans, it actually goes brown bear, black bear, polar bear. So the In brown bear, frequency. as you say, bra or black bears are um, the next most predatory after polar right. bears, which is kind of an interesting um, aspect. But it, you know, it it has been explained, and I think it makes sense that 
Um, black bears are bears of the forest. Mm -hmm. and they have trees to climb. They have the ability to try and climb trees, and that's their main habitat. Whereas brown bears are, um, their habitat is more open, and they really need to not only defend their territory, they need to defend their cubs, and they need to defend their food. And so those are the times when they will attack, and it's mostly about protecting what they have, either cubs or food, or territory, but it's mostly cubs or food most of the time. Um, but for the black bears, it's almost always males, big males that will become predatory. And then they say, you really have to be, as you said, you have to fight with all you've got because they will not only kill you to eat you, they will start eating you before you're dead. Before you're dead. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and that one just, that just sent chills down my spine. I find bears so fascinating because they are, first of all, I mean, it's hard to be around them and not anthropomorphize them a little bit. There's enough similarity that it's easy to do. And so there's that way that they, you know, they've been this sacred animal to peoples throughout time, but then we also fear them to a degree too, and and rightly so. And so they occupy both, you know, this almost like religious sanctity and yet also this well, like- I, I think it's almost- um almost an innate fear in in the way we think about fear of snakes, for example, as Mm -hmm. being because in fact, humans and bears have coexisted Mm -hmm. for quite a long time. Yeah. And I think that there is good reason why people have learned to fear bears. So, you know, it's, um, and one of the things that has fascinated me, I had I had a discussion with a fellow from Australia, and we were talking about the similarities between polar bear attacks and crocodile attacks. Hmm. So it might those might seem like wild extremes, but he was saying that in fact they both were protected from hunting at about the same time in 1972. Okay. And they are having um, a terrible time in Australia with crocodile attacks. Okay. They don't really want to let it out, get out how big the problem really is. But it is a big problem. Yeah. And one of the issues is that, okay, obviously, you know, you can, you can mitigate it somehow by saying, well, don't swim in these waters. But they will you know, you'll be standing on the shore, they'll come out and grab you off the shore. Right, right. A, big, a big one, right? And so that's yeah. where most most of the serious stuff happens. But, you know, it's for polar bears, it's like they, they come on land more. They are so strong, as I said, in their front quarters, they can easily push down a door yeah, of a house yeah. or a cabin sure. or a, I'm you know, sure. like, so it means you're not safe in your own ho- home. And yeah. that's, you know, like I told him that's the difference. It's not coming home. into your house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you. Oh man, that's really interesting. Yeah. It's weird to me when, when we have, cause this idea of a charismatic megafauna, I guess I get frustrated with the fact that we'll, when, when animals just get taken off of the, it's like I, I always bring up whaling on this show because I'm fascinated by whaling culture, indigenous whaling culture. I'm fascinated by and horrified by the industrial whaling that took place, just the loss of so many animals, yet also it's how we had an industrial revolution and <laughs> lubricated the the machinery and lit the streets and all of that too. So there's this fascinating thing. Um, but now we're at this point where whales are just off the menu. And then I kind of wonder, it's like, I'd like the idea of biologists being able to make the decision about take. And I get frustrated when it's like, no, we just can't do this anymore because of the charisma of the animal. And I'm always like, man, why can we do it with deer and elk? I don't understand. So I want there to be, I want biologists with good science making decisions about, because that's the thing. It's like, there's a great video from New Jersey of two, I'm talking full grown black bears. I mean, these bears have to be over 600 pounds each, maybe 700. Oh, wow. yeah. These are big bears. Yeah. And yeah. they are battling it out in the streets of a suburb, 
just <laughs> ripping into each other. They're knocking over mailboxes. Cars are coming by and having to like get around them. And it is right in like somebody's neighborhood, you know, because they ended the hunt there. And then these, you know, the animals start to spill right, out. Yeah. And so, you know, you have this social caring capacity as well as, the, you know, as well as the caring capacity of the ecosystem. And I just think uh, sometimes the way we manage things is influenced by, well, it's things like you were talking about. It's people lying about science. And so it's good to get some clarity from you about this issue. And I, you know, I really appreciate you being willing to take, I mean, obviously when you go against the so-called consensus, have you had a lot of, um, incidentally, a lot of scientists reaching out to you who are afraid to talk about these things, but see it as well? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, uh, they know, and it's one of the reasons why I've been attacked so furiously is it's to send a message to anyone yeah. else. Don't you dare open your mouth or this is going to happen to you. And the reason that I decided to stick my neck out was that, um, you know, I don't have an academic position that I can lose because I have this independent company where that I um, generate my income from. I'm, right. a, I'm enough separated that, yeah. um, I mean, they have been able to destroy my, um, my, academic um, connections. So I've lost my adjunct status at the university that I had held for 15 years, um, which means that wow. I can no longer do any kind of research. I can't get a research grant. I can't oh, collaborate wow. on research. So they've been able to do that to me, but they haven't made me shut up, which is really what they want me to do. What is the, what is it, what are they trying to do? Like what, you know, not with you specifically, but with this narrative, what, what do you think that the, I said before, I kind of see a lot of social engineering. That's just my personal perspective. Um, this idea of re-engineering society and the globe, you know, the geopolitics, but what, what do you see? What do you, what do you think after years of being, I guess, in the fight, uh, you know, what do you think that the big goal is and how coordinated is it? Cause it well, seems I don't know. like a I mean, coordinated message from every direction. Well, I know. And, and, you know, you could go off and, but I'm not a politics person. I mean, the yeah. reason that I went into science is that I don't actually care about politics. I'm not interested right, right, in it. Right. And yeah. so I, I Surprise. really, <laughs> like there's, there's that part of it that is just like, Oh, come on, really? But it's just, I, I really try and focus on, listen, you need to stick to the science and I don't care. You've got some ideological thing going on. You've got a, some political thing going on, but you're calling yourself a scientist. You're not sticking to the scientific way of doing things. And I'm going to call you out on it. If you're going off that track, that's as simple as that. Well, well, good job and good, good answer. Um, tell people where they find your work. I know you've got so much different stuff going on. Tell people about, you know, where they find your books or where you like to send people, you know, and all those kind of things. Well, I've, I've, as I said, I've got, I've got a blog that's called polarbearscience.com. And um, I post something usually once a week or so these days, but all of my books, there are links to Amazon where you can get, um, where you can get all of the books. Um, and I also have a sort of a writing, um, website called, um, Susan, just Susan And there'll be links to the, um, books on Amazon there. And most, most of my books are available both in ebook and in paperback formats. And I also have a book for a science book on polar bears for children, which I think might be important for some people to know. And, and really I wanted something that had, you know, the basic ecological information that was down there without the scare propaganda that you find elsewhere. Yeah. And right. it's really been a, a big seller and um, people might want to check that out. It's, it's meant for kids about seven and up. My wife's a school teacher and um, works from home privately now, but um, spent 18 years in Montreal school system. And, and anyway, uh, one of the things that I've learned as a layperson, when I want to learn about a new topic, because I talk to so many academics I like to get a kid's book. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we always talk about these kids book, but it's like, that's, I think why the idiots guides are so popular. It's like, give me just those facts in a way you would give them to a kid. And I, then I'm ready to go on to the next book. 
yeah. you know, something more advanced. So yeah. anyway, after this call, I am picking up um, Eaton because I was just reading about it this morning and I'm real interested in reading that novel, but I'm going to grab and the, your and, uh, kids book and as the well. kids book. The kids book that's called um, Polar Bear Facts and Myths is actually has been translated into five five different languages. Oh, so wow, French, cool. French, German, Norwegian, Dutch, and actually a Portuguese version is actually in the works right now. Um, so that's Let- that's the one that's most available sort of worldwide and as as being you know accessible. I, I guess my last question for you, and we'll put links, by the way, to all your stuff so that uh, people in our show notes. But um, last question is just, and I think it's kind of obvious from talking to you, but, you know, looking at polar bears into the foreseeable future, let's say, you know, a decade, 50 years, 100 years, you feel pretty optimistic about the survival of the polar bear? I do, absolutely. Because I, I think there's there's a, a flexibility in their relationship with their environment that we just haven't seen yet. And the numbers may go up or down a little bit, but I think they're going to be okay. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.